So good morning and welcome everybody to the Santa Cruz County ACES Network Learning Session on Building and Strengthening Network Connections. It's great to see everybody this morning. I'm Nicole Young and I'm one of your co-hosts this morning. We have a great session or, or series uh, lined up for you today. So again, welcome. So again, today's ACES Network of Care Learning Session is part of a series that First Five Santa Cruz County has been hosting with the support of the core investments team, which includes me, my colleagues, Nicole Les Lezen and Jasmine Sanchez and Gisela Carrasco and Stella Lauerman um, today and with Oscar Rios as well. And these sessions have been planned and some of our, our more recent ones held in partnership with Santa Cruz County's Public Health Department and the Family and Children's Services Division and Children's Behavioral Health, as well as the Health Improvement Partnership and some of our uh, more recent partners, Encompass Community Services and Live Out Cradle to Career and Santa Cruz Community Health. So it's been a really fabulous and collaborative process to put on these learning sessions. And so just wanna give a big thank you and, and kudos to the whole team. Again, we have two interpreters today, Oscar Rios and Stella Lauerman who will be joining us later. And today we have a graphic recorder also joining us, Giselle Chow who uses the she, her pronouns. Uh, so G Giselle is a consultant with Lane Change Consulting and she's based in San Francisco and resides on Ramaytush Ohlone land. Uh, so Giselle will be listening to our session and capturing what she hears in real time using text and graphics. Um, the text will be in English and then uh, the Spanish translations will be added after the event. So if you want, you can follow and hopefully you, should, you can see her screen and the work that she's doing in the um, top left video tile if you're, if you're looking at um, all the video tiles. And if you ever want to get a closer look at her work um, and see it up close, you can actually pin her video tile, her little screens. You have to hover your mouse over um, the picture of her of her screen until you see the blue three blue dots and click on that uh, and then and, and find the word pin in the menu and then you'll be able to see um, see her work up close. So you can you can go back and forth changing your views throughout the session. Um, it, I think it'll be fascinating to watch her work as as this discussion progresses. Um, and so the graphics that she's creating are meant to help us identify and remember some of the key takeaways and patterns and themes from the discussion today, and then to serve as a visual reminder um, of our collective work. And so we'll make her work available to everyone who registered after the event, along with the recordings from the session and the slides. Next slide, Nicole. And so here's our agenda. Um, we just finished our welcome overview and introductions. And so next up, we'll hear from a few speakers about our local ACEs Aware activities. And then Dr. Lisa Gutierrez-Wang, the Director of Children's Behavioral Health for Santa Cruz County's Health Services Agency, will introduce us to California's Roadmap for Resilience and talk about the importance and some of the science behind the importance of uh, screening for adverse childhood experiences. And then after that, we're so happy that Irangira Guerrero and Alison Guevara are returning to guide another conversation with some of our local experts. These are Santa Cruz County parent leaders and service providers this time. So their discussion will help us continue to center community voice and build a bridge between families and health, education, and social service providers and systems that make up our network of care. Okay, next slide, Nicole. And so now I'm going to uh, let you know who's about to speak. So we have a, a kind of a, a sequence or a series of people that will be sharing some brief updates about the work that's happening to become ACEs Aware in Santa Cruz County. So first we'll hear from Susan Paradise, who's a health services manager for the Health Services Agency's Public Health Department, followed by David Brody, executive director of First Five Santa Cruz County, then Najib Kamil, who's a senior human services analyst for the human services department in the family and children's services, and Sigalen Ortega, a program manager for the Health Improvement Partnership, or HIP. Okay, so Susan, I will turn it over to you now. 
Thanks, Nicole. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Susan Paradise, and I work for Santa Cruz County Public Health. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, why this ACES work is important from a public health perspective, and also a little bit about our ACES AWARE grants. Uh, so the Santa Cruz Public Health vision is very simple. It's better health every day for everyone. Uh, our mission is to collaborate with the community to protect, promote, and improve the health and well-being of all. Emphasis on the all. <laughs> and our values include equity, quality, compassion, and respect. Um, and while we do have some direct services in public health, like our public health nursing and children's medical therapy, a lot of what we do is around the assessment of community needs policy development and assurance. Uh, and the assurance is um, especially around the equitable access, both to health care and also all of the core conditions of health and well-being that we talked about in prior sessions, a lot of social determinants of health, where we work, where we live, where we play. Uh, and then, uh, so the ACEs Aware mission, um, is to change and save lives by helping providers understand the importance of screening for adverse childhood experiences and training providers to respond with trauma-informed care to mitigate the health impacts of, of toxic stress. So this ACEs movement is groundbreaking and uh, it's led by California Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris and also Dr. Karen Mark from the Department of Healthcare Services. Uh, Dr. Burke Harris is featured in uh, this video that I'm going to show, urging all healthcare providers to join the movement to screen, treat, and heal toxic stress. It's short but powerful. Let's start with some numbers. Adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, affect two out of every three Californians. Without intervention, they can lead to toxic stress creating long-term physical, mental, and behavioral risks for your patients. Nine out of 10 of the leading causes of death in the U.S. are associated with ACEs. And for communities that face higher levels of adversity, toxic stress can further perpetuate health inequities. That's why the Office of the California Surgeon General and the California Department of Healthcare Services have developed ACEs Aware, program that gives providers like you the power and support to screen for and respond to ACEs and toxic stress, improving your patient's health now and in the future. The number one thing that you can do to help your patients is birth protection and evidence-based treatment. It all starts by becoming ACEs aware. Sign up for the two-hour online training and learn how to screen for adverse childhood experiences and how to recognize and respond to the symptoms of toxic stress with interventions supported by science. By screening for ACEs and applying the principles of trauma-informed care in your practice, you can help California cut ACEs and toxic stress in half in a generation. Join us to make a difference. Go to acesaware.org to get trained today. Thanks for showing that. Um, so as many of you know, our County Health Officer, Dr. Gail Newell has declared racism a public health emergency and as an ACEs collective, we have committed to the Center for Community Resilience's Building Community Resilience Model that looks at ACEs as growing out of adverse community environments with a focus on racial equity. We also know that if we can impact policy and policy leaders to get at the root causes of inequities, we can move the needle to reduce the toxic stress that is currently permeating our country. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about, uh, we have two consecutive grants from ACEs Aware running now, um, which is super exciting. 
Um, so the first, uh, the first grant uh, came in uh, $172,000. Uh, public health was the applicant. Uh, and uh, we have um, very thoughtfully partnered uh, with the Health Improvement Partnership and First Five to, to carry out the work of, uh, of both grants. Um, so this first one, um, I'm going to tell you uh, two kind of two separate tracks that are very much connected. Uh, the first is the peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, and that is to, um, we are leveraging our existing Safety Net Clinic Coalition um, and our Integrated Behavioral Health Action Coalition to kind of create multidisciplinary care teams uh, supporting the implementation of the ACEs screenings in healthcare settings. So there's a cohort uh, with Salud and Santa Cruz Community Health Centers and doctors on duty. And they're working on what are the protocols needed to do the ACEs screening in the clinics. Um, focus areas include kind of overcoming the pain points of integration between physical and mental health providers who work in a healthcare team, sharing challenges and best practices and workflows with implementation of ACEs screenings and uses of clinical protocols to determine treatment plans. And then there's our network of care track, and that, that's kind of what we're doing right now. It's uh, trying to uh, have these community sessions where we have uh, opportunities for the non-primary healthcare providers to learn about ACEs and screening results in primary care settings and understand the service gaps and challenges experienced in the clinical setting, as well as building referral paths between primary care and the appropriate community resources, uh, as well as enhancing best practice treatment modalities across medical, social, and community networks of care. So the second grant um, we were able to obtain in February, uh, and that was a grant of $300,000 to enhance the planning capabilities. And, um, you know, when we started doing the work, you know, when you really start getting out there and getting feedback and learning about the pain points, then you realize, oh, wow, we need, we need more support, we need to do more. And also, you know, this past year, we had the, uh, all this complex trauma permeating throughout our community safety net. Uh, we had COVID, we had the CCU lightning complex fire. Uh, we realized that our clinics needed more support, our frontline social service providers needed more support. If we're asking folks to engage in this ACEs work, we need to give them the bandwidth. Uh, to do it because we've all got a million other things we're trying to do right now. So um, the second grant is to do really more focused planning and uh, work with all our community partners to, uh, to really try to strengthen the network and um, have all the buffering supports we need from clinic to community. So um, I think you'll hear more about these activities uh, coming soon in the next ACES Aware section. Uh, but for now, I'm going to turn it over to David to share more about the Network of Care Learning series. Thanks, Susan. Uh, welcome, everybody. Again, I'm David Brody, Executive Director of First Five Santa Cruz County. Um, First Five has been pleased to host these ACES Network of Learning sessions um, because, you know, addressing and preventing the pair of ACES uh, or adverse childhood experiences that are rooted in adverse uh, community environments is really central to um, first five, to us realizing our vision of, ha of um, healthy, happy, well-prepared children, thriving families, uh, connected communities, and equitable systems. And so while first five's primary focus is young children, obviously, prenatal through age five uh, and their families, we recognize that we have to be connected to other partners, agencies, and systems that support children and families um, across the lifespan. 
Um, so as Susan mentioned, uh, the purpose of the Network of Care Learning Sessions is to promote the ACES Aware Initiative, to share best practices and strengthen the coordination and collaboration among um, the Medi-Cal provider community and other key partners serving children and families in Santa Cruz County. Um, with support of core investments uh, and the ACES Aware planning team, we've convened four of six Network of Care learning sessions to date. Um, the first three were with the Center for Community Resilience uh, and some of their partners from uh, the Building Community Resilience Networks that they've helped create across the country. Um, and those sessions helped build uh, sort of a shared language and understanding around the pair of ACEs, examples of how to use policy as a lever for changing programs, practices, and systems, and how to be explicit about naming structural racism as a driver of inequities, while also recognizing and enhancing individual and community strengths and resilience. Um, so these sessions helped us build uh, a shared language, as I said, an understanding of systemic racism and white supremacy as root causes of adverse childhood experiences that occur in adverse community environments. Um, the Center for Community Resilience uses uh, this image that we have found quite helpful, um, a tree to describe adverse childhood experiences as the branches and leaves of that tree. Um, and it will show visible signs of vulnerability and illness if the roots of the tree are uh, growing in essentially toxic soil. Uh, and so adverse or, or what we would call adverse community environments um, and that lack of lack of equity meaning you know th there's no that there's concentrated poverty um, discrimination poor housing uh, higher risk of violence and victimization homelessness and, you know and just broadly lack of economic opportunity and social mobility um, so the pair of aces tree fits well with other frameworks and initiatives happening in our community, like core investments, a uh, collective impact movement to create the conditions for equitable health and well-being in our county. Uh, and then you can see on this slide, the eight core conditions are interconnected and interdependent, just like our efforts to build a strong ACEs network of care should be. Um, the pair of ACEs framework uh, aligns with the core conditions for health and well-being both when describing types of ACEs uh, and when describing what it takes to build community resilience, where a healthy tree represents supportive adults and healthy households that are living and growing in environments with connected, equitable systems and supports. Uh, and in fact, we can overlay the healthy tree with the core conditions graphic to illustrate that each core condition represents both the positive um, childhood and family experiences that increase resilience, as well as the systems and supports that need to be connected across the sectors. Um, so the pair of ACEs framework has been extremely valuable to us, as well as additional examples that um, the Center for Community Resilience shared about how to use policy as a lever for changing programs, practices, and systems, and how to be explicit about naming structural racism as a key driver of inequities, while also recognizing and enhancing individual um, uh, and community strengths and resilience. Um, so that is a very quick summary of a lot of content and, and a lot of really important, um, uh, an important framework that we hope helps guide our collective work uh, now and moving forward uh, in Santa Cruz County. So I wanna turn it over to uh, my good friend and uh, colleague, Najib Kamil, who's gonna share highlights from our last ACEs learning session. Najib, you there? Yes, I am. Thank you, David. All right. So, yeah, um, I just wanted to kind of help us uh, or remind ourselves about the fourth learning session that we held in March, uh, which featured a brave and illuminating and really critical conversation that was facilitated by Edendira Guerrero and Allison Guevara with parent leaders about their hopes and dreams family strengths, uh, challenges they encounter, perspectives about what it would be like uh, to have a medical provider ask them ACEs screening questions. And it was an impactful reminder about the existing resilience of children, families, and communities. But also a reminder about how bias, discrimination, and racist policy shows up in health, social services, and education services. 
and why we need to be more resolute and committed to centering community voice and leadership in our efforts to prevent, identify, treat, heal the pair of ACEs. And this was really one of the key lessons that Dr. Ellis and her Building Community Resilience Partners shared with us during their last session with us. So if we are serious about treating and preventing trauma, increasing racial equity and building resilience, we have to really acknowledge that our existing systems and the ways of working are steeped in white supremacy. And that true and effective prevention will require us to face these uncomfortable truths, uh, begin a practice of critical self-reflection, both as individuals and as agencies, uh, dismantle policies and practices that perpetuate racism and be responsive to the community community's voice. So that's what we'll continue do, to do today, to help us move really beyond words to action, right? And as Dr. Ibram Kendi states in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, he says, one either allows racial inequities to persevere as a racist or confronts racial inequities as an anti-racist. So there is no in-between safe space of saying, I'm not racist. The claim of being not racist neutrality is actually a mask for racism. So let's move towards action and anti-racism in addressing ACEs and their root causes with some of the parent leaders returning and they'll be joined by a couple of panelists from Santa Cruz Community Health Centers and Head Start. Uh, today's session and next month's session, which will be co-hosted by the Health Improvement Partnership, are designed to help us answer a really critical, important and critical and important question which is how can we make the ACEs network of care a reality in Santa Cruz County? And now Sigurdine uh, will share HIPS ACEs Aware work with us. AIG for grounding us in the importance of removing barriers and addressing systemic root causes of inequities so our families and their children can access the services they need to thrive. On that note, Susan and David have mentioned the Health Improvement Partnership is a part of the Santa Cruz ACEs Aware Network Care Grant, and our work has centered around engaging the clinics to integrate ACEs screening and work in tandem with our community-based orgs to prevent and buffer toxic stress. The ACEs Integration Cohort aims to train and integrate sustainable ACEs screening centered on trauma-informed care, as Susan Paradise mentioned earlier. Stay on the slide. <laughs> HIP has recruited 11 sites. Um, first slide still. <laughs> So HIP has recruited, um, yep, we're still here. So just wanted to make sure that folks knew, and I know Susan mentioned that we have actually recruited 11 sites across three of our clinics. So Doctors on Duty, Santa Cruz Community Health, and Salud para la Gente. And each of the clinics integration cohort is comprised of a multidisciplinary team of providers, clinical staff across behavioral health, pediatrics, OBGYN, and other frontline clinical staff clinic leadership, and data and quality improvement staff. And this care team approach is vital so that patients can access and receive the wraparound services they need to, to treat and buffer toxic stress. Uh, next slide. So this work couldn't uh, be more critical as we saw in the, uh, Dr. Nadine's Burke Harris uh, video. Um, and also as she and Dr. Mark have articulated, Toxic stress is a health condition amendable to treatment. Healthcare providers can screen for ACEs, respond with trauma-informed care, and leverage a network of evidence-based clinical and community interventions to improve health for children, adults, and families. These efforts can also reduce the risk of intergenerational transmission of ACEs and toxic stress and avert their significant health and societal consequences. Next slide. And before I briefly describe some of the grant activities, I wanted to share that the work of integrating ACEs into the clinic has been thoughtfully planned out and executed by a team of dedicated women who are not presenting here with me today, but I wanna honor their commitment to extend the reach and impact of the ACEs screening in medical and medical providers to serve our low income, underserved and uninsured communities. Next slide. So how are we working with the clinics to integrate ACEs screening into the practices? 
As this timeline delineates, since January, HIP has worked with each clinic and has facilitated two peer-to-peer -peer sessions where we gather an understanding of the clinic's baseline readiness to integrate screening into their practices, as well as have had discussions around the gaps and opportunities to adopt and integrate the screenings thoroughly. So session topics have addressed everything from workflows, clinical protocols and operations, such as billing, as well as training needs. We've also convened a joint cohort session to assess where we are as a community of clinics to pilot screenings and cross-share best practices. Next slide. And some of the key takeaways that we have um, learned to date is that our clinics really truly share a strong commitment to ACES Aware work in spite of all the competing priorities and pivoting to respond to the pandemic we've all experienced over a year now. And that that truly itself has cemented this resilient attitude that we're all in this together and acknowledges the importance of screening for ACES. And in that, understand that each clinic will have a different workflow that will build on their clinical operations and staff strengths. So a brief preview into how the pilots are looking so two out of our three clinics have started. Salud began piloting on um, just the 26th of April, so not too long ago. And doctor, Doctors on Duty has actually um, a screen up to 200 patients across uh, the Monterey and Santa Cruz County sites. And so some of the next activities we have in our grant activities are to uh, reassess where we are and celebrate the progress achieved to date, and then culminate grant activities with the celebratory cohort um, that will help us define next step as uh, both uh, David and Najib have alluded to. We hope that you all share in our clinical community's excitement and commitment to ensuring there is a coordinated continuum of care in our county and linkage to our community-based organizations. So this concludes HIP's update and I believe Najib you will introduce our next speaker. Not quite yet, but thank you. Uh, Sigalan, that was a great update and um, I'm actually going to pin the um, graphic recording so we can all see for a moment what's been happening as we've been uh, listening to the speakers. I, I think that's just so cool. Um, and actually, we want to give a chance for everyone else to chime in at this point. We're going to ask you to share in the chat, what is your agency doing to learn about and address adverse childhood experiences? as well as adverse community environments, provide trauma-informed care, build community resilience. What is your agency doing um, along those lines and, and how are you doing it with a racial equity lens? So we encourage you, we're gonna pause for just a moment, give you a chance to think and then share something in the chat. Gisela, if you wanna post that question in English and Spanish in the chat, that would be great also. Thank you. Oh, I see you did. Thank you. <laughs> um, tell us what, what you're doing in your agencies, because this will become part of the uh, way we keep the learning going as we think about how do we not just come together for these sessions where we hear from certain speakers, but how do we uh, really build a, an ongoing dialogue about the work that we're all doing in our various agencies and collaboratives and, and initiatives. Anybody have examples to share? Or are you all just admiring the, the graphic recording <laughs> like I am? Sandra says, we're learning more about ACEs with these trainings and looking how to implement it, nice. And Melissa shares, uh, we're working with probation departments to provide trauma and from trainings to volunteers and that they have an, an, a need for growth in that area. Um, Jane says, reading, discussion, examining our curriculum for trauma-informed care, affinity groups for diversity, equity, and inclusion, deep dives, mentor groups in Spanish and English. Susan's just saying she loves the graphic recording. Nice. Um, I can't read all these, but uh, here's another one from Gretchen. Their agency, they're encouraging staff to participate in as many trainings and seminars as possible to learn new information and tools. Yep. 
and Lisa sharing that at Community Bridges Child Development Division, um, doing trauma-informed systems training for all staff and anti-racism training. Um, and they actually closed their programming across the whole agency for one day. That takes commitment, especially knowing that many times those uh, program operations are tied to getting your funding, <laughs> getting paid, right? Um, using California Department of Education funding to hire a mental health professional, focusing on, on the teaching pyramid and trauma-informed care. These are all great examples. So keep them coming. Um, because again, those are things that we'll learn from and, and think about how do we incorporate that into the ongoing dialogue. So thank you for that. And so at this point, I'm gonna take a moment to just, um, we're gonna do a little switch here where our interpreter, Oscar, is going to now stop interpreting. Thank you so much, Oscar. And then Stella is going to take over as the interpreter. We'll just make sure that Stella is all set. I'm just scrolling through my video so I can make sure I can see Stella and that she is ready to go. Ready to go. Great. Thanks, Stella. Okay. And so now let's go ahead and um, Nicole, if you want to share your slides again, and Najib, if you want to go ahead and introduce our next speaker, that would be great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I am pleased to introduce our next speaker, um, who um, is a dear colleague of mine, Dr. Lisa Gutierrez Wang. Uh, she is the Director of Children's Behavioral Health for Santa Cruz County's Health Services Agency. Prior to joining Santa Cruz County um, in 2019, Lisa was the Behavioral Health Director of Clinical Innovation and Research at the Center for Youth Wellness in San Francisco. And she supported there the development of adverse childhood experiences, ACEs screening and intervention protocols. She is currently a California ACEs Aware Clinical Implementation Subcommittee member. And we are extremely fortunate to have her here in our community and here with us today to tell us about California's new roadmap uh, for resilience and why that's so important to our ACEs work. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to you, Lisa. Thank you, Najib. So it is a pleasure to be with you all today to introduce the ACEs Aware Roadmap for Resilience. Um, and we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, this looks a little new, but oh, it's a translation. This is wonderful, thank you. Um, so released in December of 2020, the roadmap serves as a blueprint for communities, states, and nations. Uh, to recognize and effectively address adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress as the root cause of some of the most harmful, persistent, and expensive societal and health challenges facing us today. The roadmap itself is available online. It consists of a full 438 page report. So it's very comprehensive. This includes an executive summary, 12 briefs summarizing key themes, a social media kit, and a webinar. So if you're interested, the webinar is wonderful. It goes over in more detail than I'll be able to touch upon today. And this webinar is really designed to be an introduction to a broad audience. So it's really applicable to share with anyone in the community who's interested in learning more about this roadmap. Um, while I'll have the opportunity to touch upon a couple of key points today, um, I definitely encourage you to take a look if you're interested in getting more information on the roadmap itself. Next slide. So the roadmap uh, consists of four main parts, and I'll just touch upon these pretty briefly. Uh, so part one focuses on introducing the framework of ACEs and toxic stress as a public health crisis and provides a foundational information on the science of ACEs and toxic stress. It also introduces the economic costs of ACEs and toxic stress on our, on our healthcare system. And these costs are significant. Part two introduces the goal of cutting ACEs and toxic stress in half within a generation. 
So this is a big and exciting goal. I will say that our Surgeon General Nadine Burke Harris has a, a vision um, and this goal of cutting ACEs and toxic stress in a generation is very exciting. And obviously ACEs aware and all of this work is building toward that goal and the significant in impact it can have on all of our children, youth and families across the state. Um, so to reach this goal, Section 2 really highlights the importance of focusing efforts across our system. So this cannot just be done within one sector. Um, it's really about investing and coordinating efforts across different levels of in intervention, whether that's primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention and intervention efforts, and then also including this work across the sectors of healthcare, public health, social services, early childhood, education, and our justice systems. Next slide. Um, part three introduces tools, resources, and strategies for moving this work forward across our state. And then section four, we'll go ahead and advance. Uh, touches upon the evaluation of the ACEs Aware initiative, so how we will be evaluating our work, how we'll be able to measure the impact. And then it also touches upon next steps and what we can see moving forward. So those are the four key parts of this roadmap. So once again, if you're interested, uh, definitely check out the resources online. But for today, I'll be kind of just touching upon a section of it. So we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so today I thought I'd touch upon some of the content from part one of the roadmap itself. Um, and this is really focusing on defining ACEs and toxic stress. So with our previous speakers, and of course, during the series of pre, uh, the previous presentations, we've touched upon what are ACEs and what is toxic stress. But I feel it's really important to continuously come back and touch upon these foundational definitions and constructs um, as we continue our work together. So when we are talking about ACEs, and by ACEs, I mean the big A, big C, big E ACEs, um, what we're referring to are these 10 categories of adversity. And these are adversities experienced by children before they turn 18, so children and youth 0 to 17. And these are really at the heart of the ACEs research um, and the science and what we're drawing upon to develop this roadmap and develop strategies to reduce the negative impact of exposure to adversity and toxic stress. So these include three forms of abuse, two forms of neglect, and five forms of household challenges or adversities that may contribute to household instability. These, of course, do not comprehensively represent all forms of childhood abusity, I'm sorry, childhood adversity or trauma. So these are just 10, and these are the 10 that really our research is founded on. But we recognize that children and youth and families and communities experience many adversities. And so that's why it's so important um, that we're really grounding our work here in Santa Cruz County and our conversation around the pair of ACEs, because that truly puts a context uh, for us to be talking about ACEs within a larger framework. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So as Nadine Burke Harris mentioned in the video, ACEs are common. Um, and we know that nearly two out of three adults experience at least one ACE prior to the age of 18, and that nearly half of children in the U.S. have experienced at least one. Next slide. What the ACEs study and subsequent research has shown is that exposure to ACEs dramatically increases the risk of negative health outcomes in adulthood, and that exposure to four or more ACEs significantly increases the risk for nine out of the 10 leading causes of death for adults in the US. So we see here that there is a dose response. So the greater the exposure to adversity, the greater the risk for these negative health outcomes across time. And there's growing evidence that suggests that ACEs are causally associated with the toxic stress response. So we've talked a little bit about toxic stress and that being the link between exposure to early childhood adversity and later stress-related disease and impairment. So what is toxic stress? 
Toxic stress is a prolonged activation of the stress response system that can disrupt the healthy and normal development of brain architecture and other organ systems in childhood and ultimately increase the risk for stress-related disease and cognitive impairment into adulthood. So we know that we all experience stress and not all stress is bad stress. Um, there is positive stress. <laughs> so we really talk about a continuum, starting with positive stress. And so when we talk about positive stress, this might be the experience we feel before a big game, a test, or an important presentation at work. Um, in this scenario, our body activates our stress response systems. Our heart rate may increase. Our blood pressure may increase. Um, hormones are released to get us activated and ready and able to meet that challenge. But ultimately, in that experience, we're able to return to a state of standard functioning for our own bodies or a state of homeostasis. The stress passes and we're able to physically and psychologically recover. So that would be positive stress. As we move along this continuum, we come to tolerable stress. This is defined as time-limited activation of our stress response systems, brought about by a more significant stressor, something like exposure to a natural disaster. So for instance, um, you know, tolerable stress might be individuals who experienced or lived through our recent fires here in Santa Cruz County. It's a stress that is specific with respect to time, um, but ultimately and hopefully that stress is able to dissipate through the support and buffering efforts um, of those around us. So for an individual who may needed uh, or who may have had to evacuate their home, um, having individuals or places or our community have resources to be able to support them um, would be able to buffer that stress. So hopefully the activation could then dissipate over time. Um, so that would be an example of tolerable stress, an activation, but with effective buffering and support, it can be managed and there is no long-term activation. Now, toxic stress is different in that we're talking about prolonged activation of the stress response systems without sufficient buffering. This is chronic activation, um, specifically when we're talking about in children, that disrupts the healthy development of the brain architecture and increases the risk for health disorders over time. So when we are talking about ACEs like exposure to abuse, neglect and other household challenges that occur over periods of time when there isn't that sufficient buffering. Um, those caring individuals, those individuals that are there to be able to put that stress in context, to be able to provide the tools and resources needed for that child to deactivate their stress response. That ongoing activation can ultimately be that link that increases the risk for the stress-related health conditions. Next slide. Um, there we go, thank you. So this slide represents some of what we've just reviewed, specifically that exposure to adverse childhood experiences without sufficient buffering or protective factors or interventions can lead to the chronic dysregulation of the stress response systems, or more specifically, the neuroendocrine immune systems and that this chronic dysregulation can have clinical implications on health. And we're talking about physical, emotional, behavioral health. Next slide. Let's see, I think this is the right slide. Um, should be a graphic, but I'll just go with it. Um, so not all individuals who experience adversity and who experience toxic stress or this dysregulation of the stress response systems experience long-term negative consequences. There it is. So we understand that even with exposure, with sufficient buffering, we can promote resilience and that those negative health outcomes are not destined. 
So that is a part of our work, to be able to identify children, youth, and families who are being exposed to adverse childhood experiences early, to intervene, and then to really support the development of effective coping strategies, skills, and effective buffering so that we can reduce the potential for risk of health conditions later on. Next slide. So one of the key takeaways um, from the roadmap for resilience is that toxic stress is a health condition amenable to treatment. So toxic stress responds to intervention and treatment. That is, I think, the biggest takeaway uh, from the roadmap for resilience and the biggest takeaway for us as community, as community members, as parents, as providers, um, that as we are identifying uh, children and youth who have been exposed to adversity, as we're identifying adults who have lived through childhood adversity, that we do have tools and strategies and ways to support them and ways to treat the toxic stress, that dysregulated activation of the stress response system. So there is always hope. Uh, next slide. Within the ACEs AWARE framework, uh, there are seven key stress busters or key pillars of health um, that have been identified by the research and the literature. And so these include getting enough sleep, so enough quality sleep on a regular basis, having access to balanced nutrition, so being able to eat a balanced diet on a regular basis, engaging in regular physical activity, cultivating mindfulness um, or doing mindfulness practices on a regular basis, experiencing and having access to nature and the outdoors, accessing mental health services when needed, and having access to supportive people in your life. Um, and so for children and families, that might mean having a supportive parent or caregiver, a teacher or a coach, a CASA, a therapist, a friend, um, and ideally for families, having a whole network of natural supports available to them. So mm -hmm. these seven key stress busters um, are ways that we can directly impact and buffer against toxic stress. And so for some of our families, some of these key stress busters um, are very accessible, but for others, because of disparities, they might not be. So in thinking about quality sleep, is there enough space uh, for children to be able to go to bed early, to have lights off? Do they have you know, their separate bedroom? Are they sleeping with others? Um, all of those things impact ability uh, or access to these stress busters. So always wanting to have that in mind as we're talking to families about how to promote health through these particular pillars. Having access to balanced nutrition means being able to access food at your local grocery stores that are um, healthy um, and, you know, fresh fruit and vegetables, etc. And we know that many of our families do live in food deserts. So always taking that perspective and that frame, even as we're talking to families about these stress busters, um, always considering what they might have access to and how we can increase access for them. Next slide. So I wanted to touch briefly upon one of the core strategies for addressing ACEs and toxic stress, and that's screening and interventions within pediatrics. So we heard a little bit earlier about the clinics here in Santa Cruz County that are beginning to screen, um, which is extremely exciting. Um, and this really is one of the core pieces of the ACEs AWARE work. Next slide. So screening in pediatrics is seen as an ideal setting um, because it allows for early detection and intervention. So most children and families visit, or most children and youth, um, you know, visit their primary care provider. And ideally, children are having regular well-child visits beginning in their first year of life. Um, and so by doing ACE screening in this setting, um, we're really standardizing and normalizing the process. We're educating families about the prevalence of ACEs and the link between exposure to adversity and stress. 
We're also normalizing the activation and the potential for the chronic activation of the stress response system and making it so that families understand that talking about stress and the seven stress busters is exactly what they should be talking to their doctors about. Next slide. So in this slide, I've got a lot of words, <laughs> but I just wanted to note that when you screen for ACEs in pediatrics, the ACE screening tool, uh, the ACE score is actually just one thing that the primary care provider is going to be looking at in determining next steps. Whether the provider is using an ACE screening tool that's de-identified, meaning it asks for the number of experiences the child has been exposed to, not which ones, or if they're using an identified screening tool, and this is a version of the tool that actually asks the individual to identify which types of adversity the child has been exposed to. So whether you're using the de-identified or the identified version, that's just one piece of the equation. The provider is also looking for signs and symptoms that might indicate the exposure or the activation of the dysregulated stress response systems. So they're going to be looking for associated symptoms um, or conditions. And these are just some of the things that they might be looking for. Uh, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. How am I doing on time? A little bit over. Um, so within the pediatric office that is routinely screening for ACEs, interventions can include the screening itself. This is a way of starting the conversation, increasing awareness, and reducing stigma. Providers can also work with families to identify and focus on increasing the seven stress busters. For example, a pediatrician can really focus on how do we improve sleep? How do we increase regular physical activity? And ultimately, how do we enhance protective family factors? And finally, the primary care provider is also instrumental in getting children and families connected to other specialty services within the larger network of care. Um, so I'm just going to end um, and talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we're doing at Children's Behavioral Health. So next slide. Oh, well, maybe we skip. Actually, can we go back one more? Sorry about that. Um, here we go just looked a little different. Um, we at Children's Behavioral Health are actually proposing a Mental Health Services Act innovation project called the ACEs Informed Navigation and Treatment Centering Latinx Families Project. Um, so what we're hoping to do is get funding to be able to bring on multiple culturally responsive parent partners and embed them in South County pediatric clinics that are starting to screen for ACEs. In this way, we can have folks that would be available for warm handoffs for children and families who have been identified as needing specialty mental health services or help navigating and getting connected to other needed services. So that's one component. The other component is that we would love to expand um, our system's capacity to really work effectively with families to ensure that our parents and caregivers are the most effective buffers possible. And so we want to introduce an evidence-based family therapy model, functional family therapy. So those are the two key components of this proposed project. And what we need from all of you is your support. And the way you would support us is to vote for our proposal. So uh, there's a link here, but I'll go ahead and make sure that I put it in the chat as well. Um, the voting actually ends Friday, so tomorrow at five o'clock. So it's a short turnaround. So I definitely encourage anyone who's interested in supporting the Children's Behavioral Health Innovation Project uh, to vote today um, and vote to support our effort to contribute to the ACEs work here in our community. All right, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gutierrez Wang, for sharing your time with us today and this fabulous presentation. I mean, I know that you packed so much rich information in there and <laughs> did a fantastic job. And, um, you know, I'm seeing comments in the chat about people feeling like they're learning things uh, just from your brief presentation. So thank you so, so much for that. Um, I want to go ahead and, and introduce our next set of speakers. And Again, we are thrilled to have two of our uh, returning leaders come back. Um, we have Erendira Guerrero and Allison Guevara, who some of you may remember 
facilitated a panel discussion with us uh, or for us last time with some parent leaders. And so we're happy to have them back again today. And so I'll briefly introduce them and, and the panel members and then I'll let them take it over from there. So Erendira Guerrero is the daughter of Juana and Librado Guerrero. She stands for opportunity for full potential for herself and others committed to learning and growing in community to move forward change that creates racial equity and justice. Erendira currently serves as the director of the Encompass Community Services Head Start Child and Family Development programs. Alison Guevara is a social impact consultant and a mother of three children working to build resilient, equitable and empowered communities where children and working families thrive. Allison co-founded and currently leads the Live Oak Cradle to Career Initiative and the Central Coast Early Childhood Advocacy Network. And joining them today are four panelists, Lisette Santana and Diana Valadez from, they are two of the um, parent leaders involved with Live Oak Cradle to Career and they were on the panel last time. Joining them today are Amanda Navarro, who's a Healthy Steps Specialist for Santa Cruz Community Health and Ana Aguado, the Family Services Manager for Head Start, Early Head Start at Encompass Community Services. So we're going to stop the screen sharing now. Um, and as Allison and Eden did I get started, I'm going to spotlight just the panel members and the facilitators and our graphic recorder. And we're actually going to ask all the other participants to turn off your videos. It'll help just make sure that the, um, internet bandwidth is, is strong enough for our panel members to um, have strong audio and internet connections. So let me work on the um, spotlighting and Allison and Irene, I'm gonna let you take it over from here. Fantastic, thanks so much, Nicole and everybody. It is so wonderful to be here um, with Irene, my partner and all of our amazing panelists. Um, so I'm just going to say a couple things. First of all, just please remember to choose your English or Spanish um, channel, especially all of our panelists, so that the interpretation comes through clearly. Um, and if you are bilingual, you can switch off from Spanish to English if you want to listen to people speaking in their native language. So um, we're going to shift now. We just got such an amazing overview of this deep learning we've been going through in our community and just really building on so much research um, that we've, we've just learned a lot. I'm very much in my head. And so I want to invite us all to kind of shift from that, that science class of really understanding the power of ACEs to now the community level and personal experience. And that's what this conversation is about. And so I'm going to have, uh, Rendra is going to set us up and kick us off. So we're going to have some questions for our panelists. And then our panelists have questions for each other. And then we're going to have a chance at the end for everybody to kind of chime in and have a discussion with all of you. Go ahead, Rendra, pass it to you. Rendra. Oops. Rendra, you're muted. Thank you of all the times I'm muted today. Thank you, Amanda. So I just wanted to say that I will be doing my part in Spanish. Um, so I will be switching to Spanish right now. So buenas tardes, igual que Allison. Yo estoy contenta de estar aquí. Good afternoon, like Allison. I'm happy to be here as one of the community voices. The only thing I'm going to say is, um, that we're here, as Najib said before, to bring the voices of the community to this process. And the way that we're going to bring those voices to you, is we're um, calling this a courageous conversation because each participant that's here today on this panel brings her story, her experience, and her knowledge to help us understand a little bit how is this application going to look in the community? And what impact do we want to see? And, and some of the strengths that we're seeing at the same time, what are some of the challenges that we can predict? So we're going to, um, we're going to put all of that information together that we've heard today in practice 
but we're also going to put that together with personal stories and personal experiences. And, and it's really special that we're taking this time to have this space because these types of conversations are the ones that really bring about change that reflect the community needs and that reflect our reality here in Santa Cruz County. So today we have the pleasure of having wonderful panelists who are going to share important information with you. So I'm going to start right away with the first series of questions. The first question that I'm going to ask is going to be for Diana and Amanda. I'm going to start with Diana. And the question is, what did you know about about ACEs and the toxic stress before in compare in comparison to what you know now? And also, what is the most important thing that you think that other people should know and understand about ACEs? The understanding about the importance of the screening and um, resilience and positive child experiences. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, as Randy uh, introduced me, I'm Diana Valadez. I'm very happy to be here again because this is a wonderful space to um, be heard. I'm going to start first about what I knew before about ACEs. The truth is I, I didn't really have much knowledge about ACEs before participating in the previous channel and I loved it. I'm so happy that there are these kinds of projects to have a great impact in our community. About toxic stress, almost all of us are living in toxic stress every day. And that's because of a trauma. But every day we manage, we manage from day to day, but we all go through different circumstances, except that we manage it little by little and we try to cure it. But I know that you who are listening to us, I know that you can help us to heal mainly and together we'll be able to do it because with different resources, we will all um, be successful. What did we learn? What have I learned? I know that there's our help and resources and I've had connections with uh, agencies I took the promotoras, uh, health promotoras course, and there they taught us to be more aware about, about the topic so that we can help the community. And I would love more parents to have access to that education. What's the most important thing that I think people should know about ACEs? In my opinion, I think that the community needs to set a stigma aside. Stigma is something that eats us alive, but we have to abandon that because if the stigma eats us alive, we cannot be successful. So we need to help each other and be, have confidence because there are resources available, services that we can take advantage of. So about the screenings, for me, it's a good idea in order to be able to know if one of our children has a problem and be able to uh, see to it immediately. Out of the negative, something positive always comes out. I don't know if I, I didn't answer something, but I think I included everything. Yes, you included everything, thank you. <clears throat> And now I'm going to ask Amanda to share. Do you want me to repeat the question for you or? I'm good to go, thank you. I just yes, wanna say you. what a pleasure it has been um, to be with other Latinx members of the community um, as a panelist here. It's unfortunately rare, but I am so excited to be here. So I'll go into my answer. <laughs> So I've been in mental health for nearly nine years. Um, and I gotta be honest with you, my knowledge was pretty limited regarding ACEs and toxic stress. 
Um, but from what I've learned in the past six months, it's been pretty eye-opening. Um, I changed my career from Santa Clara County over to Santa Cruz County uh, back in November and was hired at Santa Cruz Community Health. Um, and from there, I'm working with children zero to five. So ACEs is the core of what we're doing. So the importance of ACEs is that it's trauma-centered in a way that supports the person and the environmental factors that affects that person's well-being. You get to learn more about the risk factors and how previous experiences have truly contributed to what that person is struggling with now. In graduate school, I'm an MSW master's in social work. Um, we learn how to support people with coping skills to manage their stress. ACEs helps me understand what caused that stress to begin with, the root of the stress. And I think that that is very powerful to acknowledge a person that needs support by understanding the whole picture and not just understanding them through current symptoms. Assessing a person through their current symptoms is only one fraction, one little snapshot of truly understanding that person and their experience as a whole. I will be super honest here. <laughs> I took the screening for myself and it was really hard sitting in that seat because it does focus on the most vulnerable moments of a person's life. I'm not encouraging anyone to be triggered or feel upset by doing this if you're not ready, but I think it's super important to be in that position to understand what it's going to be like for people who do the screening or who answer to the screening. As a therapist and in mental health, we preach constantly vulnerability to our patients, vulnerability and honesty. So it's important that a part of us as providers, as workers, people support, being supportive of the community is also vulnerable too to a certain capacity, right? I'm not saying to be vulnerable and open up with all your patients. That's not necessarily what I'm trying to um, capture here. What I'm trying to capture is that being vulnerable with ourselves and in our work and the role that we play, that's gonna help us understand what it's like to be in the seat of the person that we're serving. So I hope I answered it all. I tried to do it under two minutes. <laughs> Thank you everybody. <laughs>
it's uh, they put themselves in that vulnerable space. We need to respond quickly and be ready with services and responses quickly. That it takes a lot of bravery for the fair, the parents to share these things with us. So we need to collaborate and advocate and that's going to take an effort in the community, not only from the providers and also, but from the families. And I know that Deanna and, and uh, Lisa are here to share some of these concerns from the community. Very true, Anna, thank you very much for sharing. Lisa, the response, do you have a question? or concern about the challenges that might come up as uh, providers are starting to do the ACEs screenings in the community. Good afternoon to everybody. Well, well, my concern relates a lot to Anna's concern and the um, number of lives that are going to be affected and if the resources are really going to be there to provide the support and the training that the patient needs. Because I don't even want to imagine a society with a thousand open wounds. And from all the information that we received today, I think it's necessary in our society to start working on this because uh, because I'm I'm frightened about all of the wounds that can be opened and also talking about stigmas. I think one of the things that we've heard, if there's going to be the possibility of access to this, the not having to wait a long time. Those are my concerns. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you for sharing, honestly, the, the concerns that you and Anna have. So that's the first session of questions. Now I'm going to um, I turn it over to Allison. Thank you, Aranira and everybody. I feel like Diana and Lisa, you're really naming this important opportunity we have to talk more openly about our deeply personal experiences and the stigma that gets in the way of that sometimes. And, and I, what I'm seeing in this conversation already is so much wisdom and courage that I know is going to be the source of us being able to figure this out. And so let's tap into that some more. Um, you each have some questions for each other. So I'm just gonna guide you um, in taking turns presenting those questions and responding. So I want to begin with Diana. You have a question that you're going to share with Amanda. Can you share that now? Yes. Before asking the question, I wanted to talk a little bit about myself. I love to advocate for my community, but part of my heart is advocating because of inequality and racism. And my question is good to include some of that. Amanda, how can the providers help to raise awareness uh, of that, that everyone has the healthcare and social services that they need, especially the undocumented community for the moms that are the center of their families? How can we advocate and, and fight for this together? That's my question. Thank you. Money and X, Y, Z, right? Tangible things. But I think what's so important is to first start with connection. Connection, connection, connection. I understand that not everyone has the time to build that connection immediately, but over time, it's so important to see the patient or the client as a person. Listening to understand, not to respond, not to diagnose. Nothing can be done without trust and trust is needed to be built between the provider or agencies and the patient in order for a relationship to evolve further. 
I think it's important for providers and employees of any medical or really any agency setting to hear their client or patient validate and believe what they are saying. As for the undocumented community, they are a very vulnerable population. And I think that requires more effort on our part as providers, as um, uh, different settings to support the community, to build trust and connection with this population. It requires patience from the provider, as well as a sensitivity to the many challenges that the undocumented, undocumented population faces. I believe that providers do need to do better. I'm gonna be super honest here, <laughs> and myself included, um, by being more aware of cultural factors and environmental factors that can impact that relationship and understand their own personal biases and beliefs they may have about other people, communities, populations. This is not easy, it's not comfortable, um, but I think the work is absolutely necessary. Once the trust and connection are there for people, things can happen so beautifully. Communication is open, people feel more comfortable, and that's where the advocacy and fight together begins. Uh, and I also work a lot with a lot of new mothers, new caregivers in my program. And I want to say mothers are super heroes. <laughs> um, and so I think what's most important for me and what I've learned so far is healthy caregiver or healthy mother equals healthy child. So, so many times a child is born and it's like all the attention on the child. So I think too, as providers and as uh, people in mental health or in any setting working with the community, we really need to remember the family as a whole. A child cannot succeed without a parent succeeding. So don't ever forget the caregiver or the mother, they are just as important and so key to a child's success. Thank you, Vienna. Thank you both. Yeah, Amanda, what you're saying, I feel like is, is what we're seeing with Live Oak Cradle to Career, that sense of connection between mm -hmm. parents, between parents and medical or social service providers with schools, and it creates so much potential to do this kind of advocacy and change. Um, so thank you for helping us focus on that. I, I see the power of it. How about um, Amanda? You have a question for Lisette, I believe. Yes, yes I do. Um, so Lisette. How does culture impact the way that community thinks about and connects with providers? How can culture be a strength in this work as well? Be set. La traducción no fue muy buena. No sé si puedan repetirme. Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, I can repeat the question. <laughs> How does culture impact the way the community thinks about and connects with providers? How can culture be a strength in this work? Pues, pienso que la cultura es... Well, I think that culture is what we're made of. We all have different beliefs and traditions. To in arriving in such a multicultural country like this one, we all have our own beliefs. And that's been my experience and my surroundings. There are different beliefs about the providers, but I can share. It's been difficult to access resources. It was difficult to access them. And sometimes it takes a long time to get them, what they need or the treatment. And, and even so, I think the community wants to um, approach providers, but there's fear to get what they need. So I think a strength would be that uh, willingness or desire to be a part of your surroundings or your environment, the education for our children. And we talk about specifically what we're doing in uh, Cradle to Career is this type of information 
which uh, we're exposed to. My experience, I've been here for a year and I didn't know a lot of places. When the pandemic hit, I know it was a crisis for everyone, but through Cradle to Career, uh, all of them helped me feel so much better. So I think those are strengths, the willingness to learn from the community and all of these organizations that can give us that information. Thank you, Lisa and Amanda. Gracias, Gracias, Lisa. Absolutely, it is um, such a strength, right, that for us to build on, um, and to not to miss those opportunities for for culture to help us connect, um, and to overcome the challenges that we're seeing. So let's see. Let's hear at least that your question for Anna next. Muy bien. Very well. My question. Um, oh, yo un momento, por favor. Just a moment. It's a little bit connected to what we were talking about, stigma. And I, I would love to have a healthy community that can connect with these providers and the services that they want to share with us. So my question is, how can we raise awareness about ACEs and that can be um, significant so that I can work in these experiences? How are you going to share all that information so that it can also reach the community and, and we can accept this support so that it can heal, heal the injuries that are, or the wounds that are there. Thank you for the question. I want to talk a little bit about that. Many of us grew up with adverse experiences and and a lot of us are going through those situations and using the people and places where there's trust taking into account the culture recognizing each family and learning about each family it's a learning process together we're not just going to be service providers and act like we know everything because we don't know everything. The, the families to whom we're giving the service, we need to get to know them to find out what they need and bring the information, as I said, to the places where they feel that they can trust, like schools, um, child care centers, meeting families in different forums where they're established and again in a way that's normal not not something that uh in a way that they can't understand it that's why about what we're going through so that we can talk about examples of the of the services that are available. Those are some of my ideas. Thank you, Lisa and Anna. I bet you that um, Dr. Nadine Harris-Burke and Dr. Lisa Gutierrez-Wang and, and many others would have just loved to hear that question being posed because that's like the mission, right? That they're on in our state is to raise awareness um, and to get ourselves asking the question, how can we you know, um, help people understand the connection between toxic stress and, and outcomes later in life and to hear you beginning to explore, how can we elevate that information 
in a way that's accessible to the community is just like the beginning of a really great conversation. I hope to hear more from. Um, and I want, let's see, Anna, I think our last uh, panel to panelist to panelist question is one you have for Diana. Sí, gracias. So my pregunta para um, Diana is, so my question for Diana is taking into account what we've learned about ACEs and what's been happening with the pandemic, racial, injust racial injustice, what services do our families need to begin to heal? Okay, first of all, without doubt, we need psychological help, as we've all said, to help heal those wounds that have uh, come out of the pandemic. In the second place, I repeat that the half of my heart goes to injustice, and, and my response goes to that. We also need financial help urgently. Lots of people, because of the pandemic, had to stop working completely. And they're behind in their rents or other services. And as always, the worst part is always on the immigrant community. Since they can't receive unemployment, it's unfair and it makes me angry to say that people who who day to day go out to work to earn their daily bread and take that home, they're the um, source of um, income for their families. It's so unfair being fired because you know they cannot work. And, and then other people without working are receiving their unemployment check with the, the immigrant community has to go out and work. Another thing is, as I was going to say, the racial injustice, the field workers, undocumented, with the fires that we had, with the rain, and now with the pandemic, they, as I repeat, they have to go out to work and they need to know that they're essential workers because without them, we wouldn't have food on our tables and they are the ones who get the worst of it. They're not paid overtime, as they say, until after 10 hours when at a, another job, after eight hours, they'd be paid overtime it really bothers me and that inequity hurts me. I just want to yell and scream about it and it makes me really angry. And I hope that there will be uh, help for those people and for other people who need it. Also, the mental health um, assistance is critical because there are people who suffer from depression and anxiety since we don't know what's going to happen over time and perhaps if they don't re receive that help now they'll never be able to overcome that excuse me for expressing myself like that but it makes me angry and upsets me i don't know how to express it but the people who know me a little bit know that i'm very expressive and i love to do it because it's part of what i feel and i want you to feel it the way that i'm getting it across to you excuse me and thank you Okay, I just have to say who here feels the power uh, and feels inspired by Diana right now and the strength of her voice? Because Diana, I just feel like this is what we all need to hear. And I thank you for your courage and for your strength. And to me, you know, we're, we're, we're getting close to Mother's Day and you are tapping into this incredible source of love that you have for your children and for all children and for all families. And I see you bring that into the world every day. And I feel like it's such an honor. So thank you for that. And thank you for, for taking this as an opportunity to highlight and make visible people who have far too long been um, kind of put to the shadows. 
And this pandemic has showed us that we cannot do that. We are all interconnected. We are all neighbors and brothers and sisters. And we need that love to, to break through, right? And I saw the, the um, farm worker caravan um, celebration from this last weekend, some pictures of that. And I feel like it's such a beautiful thing that we're bringing more visibility um, and lifting up our immigrant community step by step. And there's more to do. Um, and I just wanted to just very quickly kind of an impromptu question to ask you to think about with all the hardships that you've seen in your life and in the, in the people that you serve and live and work with, what have been the greatest sources of resilience? When we talk about this whole idea of buffering from adverse experiences, what has buffered you or buffered your family to help you be as strong as you are right now? Diana or Lisette, can you begin? Diana or Lisette, pueden contestar esa pregunta? First of all, I've been protected by my values that my parents gave me when I was little. I've never abandoned those. And those are the values that I've taught my children because though I'm a humble person, but I want them to know that now I can advocate for the community for future, future children and I want them to do the same. And I'm proud of them as well because I know that they're following in my footsteps and that this same thing that I'm doing, I'm hoping that they'll be able to do it as well with even more strength. And I want them to see that it's not just their mom talking on the phone, but they see that there's res responses. And with those responses, we're all going to benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Lisette, how about you? Well, I found the resilience in my family, even though they're not here close by, with their uh, words of encouragement and it helps me keep my family together. And if we're here, we're going to be here and keep trying. And the second is my community who are now part of my life. The ones who've taught me how to be here, they've supported me in every single moment. I think that is what we need. A, a community, not only resilient, but empathetic. Empathetic to the person who comes from far away empathetic to um, to the child whose ice cream cone fell on the ground and is blocking the way. I think we need empathy together with resilience. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Amanda, what are your thoughts about what's helped you feel buffered and resilient and strong or, or you or your patients? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I am, bo I was born, obviously, <laughs> um, brown, I'm female, single mother, low income, right, disabled brother, I mean everything. And so I think at that point, I was not meant to succeed. Um, but I think the support of my family is what literally brought me up. Um, I don't think I could have done it without them. I think the support that they gave me was immeasurable to my success. Um, and they saw opportunities that at some points I didn't see those opportunities for myself. So I think that's pretty incredible. And I, I agree with Lisa, we need to move forward with empathy. I lived in New York for two years. I never went by any single person without acknowledging them as a human being, even struck up conversations sometimes, even just, you know, had some cafecito with people. Like I did that. And in that way, I just feel that connection, that support is so strong. And so I'm grateful enough that I received the support I received from my family to succeed to the person I am today. Um, but I know not everyone has that. And even just a simple gesture, even just looking in someone's eyes can go a long way as acknowledging them as the human being that they are. And that's so connected to what you shared earlier in terms of just the whole family way of approaching ACEs and the, the building on connection first and foremost. Like I can see that, hear that coming through in your own personal story. Thank you for sharing that. 
Anna, how about you? What, what would you say has been um, a source of resilience or strength? For me, definitely my family, um, family and community, um, like Amanda and you know, many of us, I also Mexican, brown, um, you know, in a community where many don't succeed. And, you know, to, um, I feel blessed to be doing the work that I'm doing. And even though there's, you know, challenges that I'm able to, you know, do it day by day and definitely grounding and resilience, thinking of all the challenges that I've had and gone through and reflecting that I, you know, I've survived and, you know, remembering all the kind words and support that everyone has given me along the way um, definitely makes, you know, a huge difference and has helped to heal telling my story, of course. So that's why I think it's important. Um, it, you know, part of the ACEs is like telling your story. And I think that's, that's really important, like telling my story and hear, hearing other people's stories and connecting there um, with empathy, like at least I said, like understanding that everyone at one point or another, for one reason or another, has suffering and that there is big, big opportunity for healing and that we heal, we heal and we heal together a lot of the times through that connection and um, yeah, that human to human connection, regardless of who we are, where we come from, you know, all, all the different things that we've been through, that there is, there is power to that. Yeah. And we are so lucky as a community to have you all be part of our network of care and our community strength. And I just want to thank you for developing those questions for each other and sharing your insights. And I'm going to pass it back to Erendira to kind of our, our third round of this panel. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> it's my day today. So, um, parece que hoy es mi día. Hoy es mi día. Um, today is my day. I thought, wow, I don't know what to say. What I'm hearing, really, oof, it's very impactful. The question that I'm going to ask has to do with the um, network of care, but before that, I want to talk about the points that I heard, some of the points that I heard, and it, I remember so much. I don't, I don't know if you know uh, Jerry Tello, but he talks a lot about centering the culture in the middle of changes, the culture and the humanity. And one of the most important parts to find a solution is to see our humanity and that we can take actions that help us feel that we belong, that we belong as people to our families, that we belong as people to the community. All of you have spoken about in your answers about this. And the, the question that I'm going to ask now is going to be a question for all of you. And we're also going to have the opportunity so that the participants can also answer the question. We're going to ask the participants to respond in the chat and Allison is going to help us to read, uh, bring some of those responses to the space. But I'm gonna start with Amanda. The question is, what does circle or uh, network of care mean for you specifically from your perspective who or what type of people or agencies should be in the network? And what should a network of care do, not only to cure, treat and cure ACEs, but also to support positive uh, childhood experiences? Absolutely, thank you for the question. So um, I actually was thinking about this yesterday. I was like, network of care, hmm. 
Uh, there's no clear definition out there. So I really thought about it. And I think all types of people and agencies can be network of care from healthcare to mental health, to the school setting, to even volunteers, to parents helping parents, things like that. I think every single person and industry can truly make an impact on a person or a family. I envision all these different types of work to be a circle around the family, providing the protective and trusted shield that is needed to move the family forward. So I think it's always important to remember that we providers and therapists and everyone else trying to work with our community, we're not the driving force, right? I like to use the analogy, and I have been for a long time, I'm a visual learner, that we are in the car with the client and they are driving. We're holding the GPS, supporting them with where to go, but they're the ones doing the work. A network or networks of care should be really reflecting on what they can do as trained specialists to improve trust and improve trust and connection within the community. It's easy to define the patient or family as the problem, right? We're like, oh, X, Y, Z is the problem. But in reality, it is us, 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 as the providers, as specialists, as trained people that are unknowingly or knowingly doing something to gatekeep this family from success. It means having uncomfortable moments with yourself and your bias to understand how to expand in openness and trust with others. It starts with us. Um, our beliefs, our internal biases, the things we've all been taught, this can be so harmful to our community, and it's important to understand that. But understanding is really only the first part, right? And I will say that's a very brave step to do first. Um, but the next step is reflecting on how to improve change within ourselves, the work that we do, and then putting it into action. So I cannot express how uncomfortable these conversations can be, but I am always raising my hand at meetings. I am always saying what I feel needs to be said. And I think that's what we need to do. We need to be brave for our community, for the people we serve and brave within our, um, our realm and what we do and brave within ourselves as well. So thank you. <laughs> Muchas gracias, Amanda. Uh, thank you, Amanda. And, and in your um, response, I can hear your pride as a provider, and I can also feel, as Diana commented before, the values. You're talking about the values that we need to have as providers when we're and join a, a circle of care. The, the question is for Diana now, what, what does the uh, network of care mean to you? specifically. I understand that it's a system of services that provide services for the community to be able to provide quality services to each individual. And what, what type of people should be in the network? Because there's so many doctors, specialists, counselors, psychologists, clinics, schools, um, positive parenting classes, triple P, which is really important, therapists, um, coaches, nutritionists, parents and caregivers, and obviously the community itself. I know that all of these services are uh, needed because everyone needs these kind. Not all of us need each one of these services. Everyone has their own individual needs. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. I could visualize that network with the different programs and service providers you just mentioned. It's a very strong network, what you just mentioned. Allison, is there some comment? Yeah, so I think um, Stephanie was sharing just this sense of how important it is that we don't sort of work in silos. We, you know, silos where we kind of we have or one organization over here working with family and another organization over here probably working with the same family and, and how important it is that we work collaboratively across our agencies. Um, so maybe, you know, I don't know if one of the panelists wants to talk about their experience. Um, and when you think about the network of care um, and this sort of more collaborative approach, what are some of the challenges or opportunities you see? Uh, 
Anna, do you want to maybe take a, a chance to respond to that? Um, yes. So in terms of the network of care, I do agree with what Diana and Amanda said. You know, Diana, Diana ya mencionó muchos. Voy a cambiar español. Yeah, I'm going to switch to Spanish. Right. Yeah. In terms of a, a network of care providers who are collaborating in the process of screening that are easily accessible and responsive and that we collaborate with each other because sometimes in our programs, we don't know that they're giving services to the same family. So it's important to communicate among ourselves, like the programs like Diana mentioned for preventive services to include representatives of vulnerable populations, as Diana, Diana mentioned, and advocate for what they need, and also include representatives who can uh, advocate for those needs. And together, we make decisions about the services that are going to be offered in the community and how they're going to be offered in the community. And together, we have a lot of power. In the last panel, Deanna said something very important about that. The services that she received uh, or didn't receive that she needed, it wasn't presented in the way that she would have liked. So it's important that we listen to those concerns. How are those and what are the services and how are they needed? And also, it, it should include uh, early intervention services like early education. And in our program, one of the things about those seven factors that were mentioned, our program um, takes foreign of those things into account when you participate in our program. So if we have more programs like this for prevention in the community, <clears throat> we're counteracting the effects that um, some of the adverse experiences, it's very important that we educate ourselves, not only about interventions after it happens, but prevention <clears throat> and giving that uh, support to the family. In supporting our children, we need to support all our families. And I know that there sometimes there are people who don't have a connection to the community. So offering that community and creating those connections because, because as the saying says, it takes a whole village to raise a child successfully. And if we don't do that, and if we know of a family who doesn't have those supports, we need to do something to provide those supports to them. Thank you. And strength is in numbers. Why duplicate or replicate services that are already being offered where we can use resources and perhaps energy on other things? But I loved what you said, Ana, about not forgetting about prevention and the strategies and the strengths that we have in the community that focus on prevention, which is so important in this work. Thank you, Lisa. The question now for you is the same. <clears throat> what does the uh, network of care mean to you? Who should participate in this network? Um, the network of care are those supports, systems and, and organizations that are willing to collaborate in our community and sharing what we have. I, I think that's who should be in, in the network people who have the values 
clear values and what they want for the community. And also, as Ana said, I think all of us who live in the community who have these um, challenges or difficulties should be mothers with crying children, a little bit uh, wiggly. I'm, I'm here because I want a better space for my little guy. And I think we all have an interest in that. And what I want for my child, I want for every child. Thank you, Lisa. Yes. Thank you for normalizing and saying this is a wonderful example of the spaces that we need to create where you have mothers with babies, people who, like Amanda said before, with that passion to work, <clears throat> as Anna said, that we want to work and learn. We, we're not coming here saying that we have all the answers, that we want to learn. And as Diana said, with the passion, with the passion of wanting to see change and using spaces to talk about the important conversations. So thank you to all of you for your responses. I think definitely you've given us a lot to think about, a lot to follow up on, and I'm sure that the participants, many of the uh, provider participants and other people in the community, I think that they'll always are connecting to the things that you've said and thinking about the other things that have been said today. So I'm very grateful to you for your participation and having collaborated with us on this project with Alice and myself to bring this information that has so much value for the community and moving um, ACEs forward, the ACEs awareness forward, that we're working in a community where we can create strong and healthy families. And now I will um, let Allison finish up. Oh, I just think this was so beautiful. Um, Lisa, I'm so happy. I think everybody here is happy that we got to see your adorable baby. <laughs> and, um, you know, Rita had actually chatted this, this you know, this term whole village, the whole village. And then Anna, you said it. I don't even know if you read it in the chat, but I, I feel like that's what, that's like the phrase I think that I'm going to take away, especially when I look at Giselle's, you know, visual capture of this conversation, just that, that idea of a whole village that's culturally responsive and equitable. Um, I think I, I'm just excited that we're able to come together today. So thank you so much to all of our panelists and to everybody for listening in. I'm going to pass it, um, I think, over to Amy and Sigolene who are going to facilitate some Q&A. Gracias. Thank you, Lisa, Diana, Amanda, Ana, Rendira, and Allison for that courageous conversation. Um, we, have, we have time um, for a couple questions from the audience for panel members. So I wanna check first um, if any participants on the Spanish channel would like to ask a question. And Amy, I see a question in the chat in Spanish. You want to read that one yes. out loud? I can, yes, I can translate it sí, as well. No. Um, so there's a question in the in the chat um, asking if there is a plan um, to get to continue this plan that we discussed. So I, I'm assuming um, if there is a plan to continue building the network of care. Not sure um, if Amanda or Anna, maybe you want to take um, a first step at the question, given your experiences um, and your work. Yeah, absolutely. I can give this a try. <laughs> um, I will say we've already started and we are going to continue, continue, continue. If you cannot, I'm sure you can see the passion that we have. Anna and I met separately yesterday and immediately started already connecting our resources and our programs together. So in that sense, absolutely. As a social worker, as a worker in the community, absolutely. We are starting, we are continuing, and this is just the beginning. Thank you. 
Um, I also, we have a time for another question. Does anybody have a hand up um, or have a question that they would like to put in the chat? I'd actually like to ask a question. Um, I heard um, like Diana and some of you talking about in terms of what's needed, you know, having resources that are available and accessible you know, to all families, like you know, counseling, psychological services, financial services. And I guess I'm curious, like, is it that there aren't enough of those resources available or that there's actually barriers and difficulties accessing what is available and like what should the service provider community be doing differently to make those accessible? Amanda, would you like to answer that? I was just going to say, should I answer that? <laughs> okay, I just don't want to take up all this space, so please, like at any point in time, um, anyone else can answer. Um, I actually think it's both, Nicole. I think it's both barriers, and I think it's not enough resources. I think there's a lack of understanding and a lack of connection that drives those barriers, but I also do think that... Um, there absolutely is a lot that are providing barriers for um, community resources and there's just not enough. I mean, number one, housing. Housing is almost triggering as, as a worker to hear because it's so hard to connect to stable housing, right? And that's such a basic need that every, that's a basic right. Everyone should have housing. Um, so absolutely, I think there's just a lot of barriers, a lot of disconnects um, and not enough money. I mean, we look at the wealth, right, in this world in this country in particular, the wealth is so disproportionate um, that it's just not like most people are suffering and those are living in luxury, have not a care of financial care in the world, right? Um, and we see that all the time, so. Thank you, Amanda. Um, we have time for one more question and maybe Lisa and um, Diana maybe can answer this one. And the question is, any suggestions on how to make existing services more welcoming for families? <clears throat> Diana or Lisette, Diana, uh, or, whoops. ¿quieren contestar esa pregunta de cómo los proveedores pueden hacer los espacios más uh, bienvenidos para las familias o más acogedores para las familias? about how to make spaces or services more accessible or welcoming for families? Um, referente a que a todos los servicios? Referring to what? To all the services? To the services specifically like the ones we're talking about today? In my perspective, I, I think they should expand to have more spaces like this so that the community can be more involved and they, they can know that help and uh, support is available. But we need to start somewhere. And the question, I think, uh, you spoke about this a little bit on the last panel, like to go to a clinic or a doctor or an office of fa family services. What would be, what would, be needed in that space to be more welcoming for families. To, as I, I gave my point of view in the last panel, um, first is trust, the trust between the doctor and the patient, the patient with the doctor, that you feel free to express what you have, what hurts, but obviously also it's very important to repeat the language that there are people there who say, you can say, I'm a female and I would like the interpreter to be a female because with, there's a man who's going to interpret and I need to uncover my body, that's going to make me very uncomfortable. So I want to, I think mainly the trust Thank you, Diana. You're welcome. Yes, thank you, Diana, Lisa, Amanda, Anna, Erendira, and Allison, again, um, for your time and for your bold, courageous answers. Um, I'm going to transition us and have Sigolan join us. 
um, to facilitate our next part of the conversation. Thank you, Amy. Just wanted again, thank the panelists for being authentic and show and sharing your perspective with us is very enlightening. And our job as people in the community that are here to serve our community is to uphold what you've said and uh, let you know that we listen and we'll do our very best to, to meet your needs. So I believe there's a slide that I am to introduce in terms of what we're planning for our very last session. So next month will be our uh, the last session that First Five and Core Investment will host um, in collaboration with HIP. And again, it's to really build on and strengthen the connections between healthcare providers doing the ACE screenings and the agencies providing the services that buffer the effects of adversity and toxic stress. So our panelists expressed that need and hopefully this session will meet that, um, what, what you've all shared today with us. And what we're planning to do is uh, share some of the key findings that we had in a recent assessment that we um, employed to kind of assess where our network of care is countywide. And then we'll invite a panel of agency leaders um, to really uh, share what they've learned this past year through the ACES Aware activities and where are we going from here? How do we continue to build, strengthen the connections between our medical, social and community networks of care in order to screen, treat, heal and prevent adverse childhood experiences that are rooted in adverse community environments. So before we end today, we wanna to give everybody that's tuning in a chance to share um, and answer via the chat. What was the most important or helpful thing you heard or le learned in today's session? So I'll pause and please feel free to put in your thoughts on either Spanish or English. And we have uh, from Liliana Zamora, panelists firsthand experience. So what I'm hearing from that, the importance of weaving in the community and uh, our parents' narratives and lived experiences. I also see Julie saying, hearing the community voice is so valuable. And Miguel asked to repeat the question, but it's in the chat. <laughs> And let's see, Ida Maromo was saying, thank you all for the information, it was great. And I'll continue to allow folks to chime in to that, answer, that question, but let's go ahead and move on to the, to the next question. And another thing we wanna use to inform our session, our last session is, what is something that you're interested in learning um, about in the next session regarding ACEs or the concepts of the network of care? I do see a chat from Erendina that says that the importance to continue focusing and investing programs that support, support prevention like early care. Lisa Hinman saying resiliency. And then Margarita Fernandez said that for her, the most important thing is to listen from the parents understand how they feel and what their needs are and understand the needs in the community. And thanks um, everybody for uh, sharing their stories this afternoon. Another request is toxic stress is treatable and buffering is a key. So thank you Lupe Serna for submitting that. And then Corey Burt said, I appreciate the stress busters list and focus on how to increase access for families. And I think those are the ones I read. Uh, please pardon me if I did not read your, for, for time purposes, we will go ahead and read those um, and digest those and 
the ACES planning team will um, do our best to address these topics in the next, next sessions and find other ways to embed um, learning and discussion in other future meetings. And I just wanna thank everybody for being in this space with us today and helping us further deepen the conversations for session six. Um, and as ideas and questions come up, feel free to add them to the chat or reach out to Nicole and the planning team. Nicole, back to you. Thank you so much, Sigalen. Um, and so just as we finish up today, uh, I'd like to give a chance for the panelists to share final words if they'd like to. Um, I hope you can see in the chat just how much deep appreciation is being expressed for not only your knowledge and, and your willingness to share your experiences, but just <clears throat> your um, kind of encouragement for all of us in terms of how we both need to and, and can continue to work together. So thank you so much. Um, if anyone wants to share, any panelists want to share some final words, uh, feel free to do that in the, in the chat. And then before everyone leaves for today, we do want to ask you to all share your feedback with us about today's session. <clears throat> Giselle is going to post the links to these surveys in English or Spanish um, for you to fill out, or you can use your camera icon, <clears throat> camera app on your phone to scan the QR codes to um, fill out the feedback surveys. We do really appreciate the feedback and use them to continuously plan and improve these sessions. Uh, next month on June 9th, that will be the last of these six sessions, this uh, series that we've planned. And so please save the date, June 9th from 11.45 to two o'clock. Uh, that one will be co-hosted, co-facilitated by the Health Improvement Partnership, as Sigalen just mentioned, um, really focused on you know, getting to know our network. And I loved some of the panelists' comments about you know, how the network really should be anyone and everyone that cares about kids and families in our community. So uh, the registration is not yet active and open, but it will be coming soon. So please save the date and we will share the recordings from this session in both English and Spanish and the beautiful graphics and, uh, and visual you know, notes from today's meeting with all of you, uh, hopefully next week, but as, as soon, again, as soon as they become available, we will, and ready to share, we will pass them on to all, everyone that registered actually. So thank you again so much. Thank you to our, all of our speakers, to our facilitators, our panel members, everyone that made today's event such a great success. So thank you everyone. We'll stay on for just a few more minutes in case anyone has any um, you know, burning questions or comments they wanna share, but otherwise we will say goodbye for today and I hope to see you again next month.